It's the Too Dumb to Quit podcast with Jeremy McCall. He's dumb, way too dumb to even quit. So, you know, he has his own podcast now. That's right, I do. Welcome back to the podcast, gang, here on planet Earth. The third rock from our sun corkscrewing our way frantically through space. It is crazy to think about what our reality is living on this planet, living on a rock hurling through space at 67,000 miles per hour. And just to think about the absolute madness of that in itself. And then imagine the dumb shit that we get hung up on, the stupid stuff that we worry about. We worry about, you know, we... We live our life based on social platforms and TV shows and fashion and politics, our jobs, all that. And we worry about that shit. We worry about when someone unfriends us on Facebook. Facebook, that's a real fucking thing in our society. I was unfriended. I was blocked. I'm feeling triggered. So on and so on. So-and-so blocked me. They unfollowed me. They didn't like. They didn't share my post. We are hurtling through space. It's a fucking miracle. <laughs> we, shouldn't, we shouldn't even be here. This, should, this shit shouldn't even exist, but it does. And it doesn't matter what your belief is on how we got here. God, evolution, single-cell microbes, a fucking accident, a natural accident, a biological accident, aliens. I don't, it doesn't matter doesn't care i don't care the odds of us existing at all at all are microscopic and we fight about the dumbest shit imaginable the fact that we're born into this world a total mathematical anomaly you beat the odds by being born the earth god the universe however you want to see it has laid out this perfect set of conditions where air, water, a stable climate to survive. That's nature's contribution to you, to us, to me, to everyone you know, upon being born. No matter what shape people say the world is in now, that's not what I'm talking about. It's what we're given upon arriving. Nature's contribution to us. We grow, we learn, we laugh, we sing, we dance, and then we go to school. And through school, that innocence is eroded away by people telling us a certain way to walk, to be, to fall into line, not to stand out, to sit down, act accordingly. Now, obviously, within our society, we need parameters of how to act. We don't need people walking around shitting on the ground and throwing it at each other. That's not where we need to be in a society. Portland, San Francisco, (laughs) looking at you. (laughs) But obviously... We need to be taught how to function in society as we're grown by our parents, by authority figures, by the people that are bringing us up. But somewhere along the way in our journey of learning, graduating high school, graduating college, whatever, we all begin to fall into this trap. The trap of losing our identity altogether with this illusion of happiness. We call it benefits, dental, weekends off, summers off. And how many people fall into jobs that we hate? So many of us fall into shit we can't stand. And we give into this illusion of security. We're given clothes to wear that, we, that are uncomfortable. We don't like. Shoes we don't like. A never-ending purpose of generating money for a machine that doesn't give a shit. A faceless corporation. That's our job. Keeping productivity at a high while making sure that humor and individuality and passions are subdued so we don't interfere with what matters. That's what these faceless companies and corporations, that's all they, the only thing they care about is the bottom line. They don't want you laughing with your coworkers, cutting up because some dipshit at the water cooler is gonna make a joke about vaginas or dicks or some stupid shit like that and then the company's gonna get sued and have to give someone a million dollars. So, We're forced, slowly. It's all brought on slowly. It starts in kindergarten. Get in line, sit down, be quiet. Crisscross applesauce, all that shit. When what we're trying to do is we're trying to catch the butterfly outside and not shit our pants. (laughs) 
But what is our big payoff? What is the payoff? Think about that. Step back from the grind in your mind and ask yourself, what is the payoff for what we're doing? A nice car, a bigger TV, two weeks off a year, paid vacation, two weeks. And then you start to see people just living for five o'clock on Friday where you're going to have two days and three nights to just lay on the couch or get drunk or go golf to be quote unquote you to enjoy that big ass TV you bought. That's the payoff. What happens when you work for that faceless fucking company for 40 years? You retire at 60 to go finally live how you're going to live after two-thirds of your life is gone and 18 months later, you die of a stroke or a heart attack or in a car crash or you fall down the fucking stairs on that deathbed. What are the last thoughts going to be? What are your last thoughts going to be? So much wasted time. I don't think anybody is laying on the bed saying, I wish I would have just gotten an extra 80 hours of work in. 80% of people around the world say that they're unhappy with their daily lives or they're unfulfilled. And it got me to thinking of who's to blame for that? Who's to blame for our unhappiness or unfulfillment? So I want to ask you. I want to ask ourselves who's to blame what are we contributing to us to ourselves to our neighbors to our community to the world how are we giving back as a contribution as a thanks to nature for us fucking even being alive how are we contributing or are we just going through the motions slowly dying and i cannot wait to get till friday at five o'clock because if you're living just to get through the week to Friday, you are missing five days a week. You're giving the majority of the only currency we have away, which is our time. It's all we have. And instead, we allow ourselves to get sucked into shitty TV. We watch, you know, talented people lip sync karaoke. That's entertainment for us. We watch garbage TMZ videos or shows to keep our monkey brains entertained to get those small shots of dopamine. Watching other people follow their passions and their dreams because we're too scared or we're too inputted into a system that we won't allow our, our dreams to go out and do that. We won't allow our passions to take the front seat. So we'll watch other people chase theirs uh, for a short amount of time, <laughs> you know. That's why we pay $40 to go to a concert, to be taken somewhere else with an arena of people who all feel like we do. We're all looking in one direction, a handful of people on stage who are doing their own thing, which is what you do to stay off this faceless box for our short time here on earth, to stay out of the faceless box, those companies, as I should say. We flock to people who refuse to be the same. In school, kids who stand out or refuse to conform are troublemakers or they're dreamers or they're struggling with ADHD or my personal favorite, which was what I was told my entire uh, school career. I don't know if you could call it a career, but the nine years that I was in school, not living up to his full potential. I was that kid. I was the class clown. I had a weird home life. I didn't fit into the box. I sucked at school because I wasn't fucking interested in it. I didn't learn in that way. I learned things socially. I learned more from watching comedy specials than anything I did grades kindergarten through eighth grade. I was watching shit I shouldn't have been watching, probably. I was in places I shouldn't have been. Bars, honky tonks, while my parents were playing in bands. Yeah, sleeping in bar parking lots and in a van or whatever, you know. Uh, yeah. It was weird. It was different. But, um, you know, I was getting pointed out in class because I was an asshole. And getting pointed out in class is the system's way of trying to humiliate you into conforming. You know, I was always kind of the kid that they would hear about um, before I got there. And they would pass me through the grades. I had shit grades. And I'm talking like third grade on. And how do you get shitty grades in third grade? I did. Um, and, but they would pass me along because they didn't want to have to fucking deal with me again. 
And in middle, in middle school, they just couldn't figure out how to get me to, quote unquote, apply myself. And the school decided it might be uh, best to teach me a lesson by taking me out of two classes a day and putting me with the janitor, making me work with the janitor. And I think looking back on it, they thought it would humiliate me. Having your classmates see you sweeping the floor while they sat in classes working on math or geography, whatever bullshit they were doing. So they put me with the school janitor uh, for two hours a day or 45 minutes, however long those classes are. Um, two hours a day. They put me with a janitor named Charlie. <laughs> I would sweep the hallways. I would scrub markers off of lockers or gum off of a desk, probably markers that I wrote on and gum that was probably mine. I, I Look, I, I can't deny that I wasn't an ass to deal with. Um. But while I was doing that stuff, what they didn't understand, the school didn't understand, what I didn't know walking in is that Janitor Charlie wasn't the type of person to conform to a system either. He had already retired from a successful career and was doing this, and, and um, I was put with him. And he showed me respect immediately. It wasn't, oh, here comes this kid. He gave me respect immediately, but he demanded it in return as well. And... He didn't make me call him Mr. Alexander. He introduced himself as Charlie with a handshake. And after, you know, weeks of getting to know him and, and working with him, I called him Mr. Alexander or Mr. Charlie because of the respect he gave me. He earned my respect, which is something no other teacher in my life had done up to this point. And so Charlie shows me how to sweep and mop and all the stuff that goes with the job. But he also would just slide these nuggets in of not to give in to things. He would say, man, don't let this break you. Don't let this embarrass you. He talked to me like a man. We cussed. I told him inappropriate jokes, and he laughed. And um, he approached me in a way that I could understand. He was really my first teacher in, what, I guess the eighth grade? The first time a teacher that I had who gave me strength and focus to go after what I wanted. He taught me I didn't have to be good at school to succeed. He would say, man, this is just shit you have to do right now. This isn't life. You're not, you're not destined you know, to be a fuck up. This is just what you have to do right now. So you have to find the opportunities in it to get better. He told me I didn't need college, but I did have to find a way through the system until I could go out on my own without getting too fucked up along the way. I absolutely lived for those 90 minutes a day. That janitor, Mr. Charlie, did more for me in 90 minutes a day than any teacher ever had in eight years of school. And I attribute all of the goals I've reached and the chances I've taken and the risks I've taken and the opportunities I've jumped on to pushing a broom and talking with Charlie Alexander. And like that old saying, you might not be able to change the world by yourself, I think a lot of people say, well, what does it matter? What does it matter? I, I can't change the world. I'm in Post Falls, Idaho, a janitor. But you can change things for people in your life, and that in turn changes the world for them. Charlie contributed to the world by giving hope and dignity and power to people and kids who were being disciplined by the system for standing out or not acting right. I can say with 100% certainty that while he wasn't the last teacher to um, inspire me, he was the first. And I would absolutely not be where I am today without him. I think a lot about that. Um, there were two more teachers down the line, Dave Smith, Bill Dean, who both took a similar stance with me. And I think about what I'm contributing. And what am I doing to help someone around me? And uh, it's especially weird in the music business because you'll do things and the first thought is, well, man, I might lose this if by helping someone with this. And am I not helping someone because my ego tells me if I do this, they might take my spot? How many jobs are like that? Well, if I, if I set him up with this, I might get shit can next year because I gave Bill my spot. But it comes down really to, I've never been hurt by helping someone else. I've been burnt. I'm not saying that, but in that I learned as well. I found that as an opportunity to learn. 
So are you fulfilled? Or is there something you could be doing to live the life you want right now? Who are you contributing to? Who are you helping? Maybe you're struggling right now to live that life and you have to work three jobs to make it possible. I'm not saying go quit your job, go backpack through Europe. I'm saying step back and define yourself to yourself. Define your contributions to yourself, to your community, to your family, to the world, to yourself. Define your happiness. I work more independently than I... I, I work more hours independently than I ever would as an employee somewhere. Because doing shit your own way comes with some super dire consequences. Financial hardships. You might be hustling three jobs to pay for a place to live, but that is the contribution to be able to do what you want to do. And I promise you, if you keep hustling, if you keep grinding, the payoff comes. It will come. The opportunities will come. They might not come in the way you want them to come. They might not come in the way you expect them to come, but if you keep working and you don't give up, they will come. And if you outwork everyone around you with a relentless goal of your happiness, your contribution to your life and those around you, I promise you it will happen. But it can't happen without defining what it is. You put a sailboat in the ocean with no uh, target in mind of where you're headed, you never know where you're going. You have to force yourself into uncomfortable situations. And when you're finding these things, I did it two, two years ago with jujitsu. I, I wanted to get in shape. I, I've never been in shape. I've never been competitive in anything. All I've done since I was 12 years old is play music. Maybe for you, you want to try that spinning class or weightlifting or jujitsu or philosophy class or you want to try glass blowing or another art or swing dancing, just get out and move. The more you give your mind and body the resources it needs to thrive more clearly, you will begin to see and define what your happiness is. You have to take chances and take opportunities and stay hungry. Not being reckless. Don't be dumb. You know, you got two kids at home. You can't quit your job and go backpacking through Europe. It's going to have dire consequences for the people who love you. You have to keep your head clear and define what makes you happy and find a way to start contributing to it, to yourself and to your community until that's the only thing you have to do. It's small steps sometimes. You're not always jumping straight into, you know, a record deal. You're not always jumping straight into being a CEO at a company. That shit doesn't happen. And when it does happen like that, it's not appreciated. This is the way you start with it, small steps. Start sponging up all the things that work around that job. How can I find a way to get to where I want to be? This, in turn, changes your world and the world of those around you. It's, it seems so simple, but so many people just look past it because it's an illusion of security. It's an illusion that, oh man, I, I really, it's not what I want to be doing, but I'm good. If you just keep sweeping the floor, my friends, it is better than a suit that you hate every day. Fitting in is boring, and, you know, we're better than that. So, uh, something to think about today on the Too Dumb to Quit podcast. I want to thank you for spending some time with me today. I want to go send you all the website to check out, too. Now, um, this kind of goes along with what we're talking about. Uh, this is, and I want to get this out. This is not a sponsor deal. I'm not getting paid for what I'm about to tell you anything like that. This is just a company that I want to share because it's inspired me uh, with their message, with their mission. I love it. I wear their shirts all the time. They have an amazing message and um, it may touch you. It, it may help you find some strength on days where you're, you know, I, I put it on on days when, I, when I'm struggling. The name of the website is called Ape Man Strong, A-P-E-M-A-N Strong, Ape Man Strong. And go to their shirts with meanings. They have a whole thing. Their packaging is amazing. You get it in the mail. It's got a big, um, uh, you'll get a bunch of postcards that have different inspirational things on it. But it's got, each shirt has a mission that might touch you. So you might be inspired like I was. Again, uh, check it out if you're feeling it. If not, I want to thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Go out, change someone's day-to-day -day with kindness and nothing more than being you. Love you guys. Thank you for, uh, for coming in. Make sure you're following me on Instagram at McCombover 
over on YouTube, uh, official Jeremy McComb, and on Facebook, Jeremy McComb Music. Um, I want to thank you guys for continuing to push this thing on, sharing it with your friends, subscribing wherever you're listening to it. Uh, make sure you share it. If you're listening to it on Spotify, tell your friends about it. If you're listening to it on Google or Apple Podcasts or Podbean or, uh, or even over on YouTube, make sure you're sharing it with your friends and neighbors if it's touching you. I appreciate you guys being with me, and I will talk to you all next Tuesday right here on The Old Shindig. <laughs>